and they put on the e-campus and you can see it. And uh, uh, at the same time, I will be also posting my last year, which had the zone recording with each of all the slides. Okay, because this is recording only this section. And when I draw on the blackboard, but on the other side, uh, you may not see it, but the slides recording, which is each slide I did last year, I also going to put on the e-campus, so you can see it. In case some of you are not here for any of the reasons. Okay. So, let's talk about today is continuing the lecture one, uh, history and the basic general microbiology, then we're going to move on to talk about microscopes. Uh, some of them connected to the lab, and we were just going over it very briefly, but some of them we talk a little bit detail. Okay, we mentioned, um, what is microorganism? It's too small to see. So we need some talk. Now who is, the, what the name of the talk is microscopic. Now who is the first person to create it? And describe microorganism use microscopy is Antonio Ben Levenko. This is some trick. Whenever you see somebody have a middle name Ben, this usually coming from Dutch or Netherlands. Okay. Do you like the soccer team of, of, of Netherlands? I like that. The yes. orange t-shirt is very good, played very well, it used to be. Okay. So you do you see the van in the middle, that is Dutch. So Antonio van Leeuwenhoek is a Dutch microbiologist. He has been saying himself, he's an amateur scientist, because most of the time he's doing the business uh, in the European, and uh, his hobby is doing some of the scientific research or discovery something. So he created this mechanic microscopic right on the slides and you can see it there is a lens specimen holder focus screw handle now what is the magnification of his microscope this is a probably 200 plus mag magnification so compared to today this is a little bit less okay and he recorded it. That's very important. Lots of the time, at, the, at that period of time, they say they created a microscope. They find a microorganism. They did not record it very well. He recorded it. So he finds all these things. Like this, like that. Later on, about recently, I'm also looking at many, many years ago, people do some of the back research. When he finds those, actually, we will say the movement of bacteria. It's not like the bacteria morphology. So some people also say possibly these like a flagella, which means the structure of a bacteria. Or they see the bacterial movement, not really a part of the structure of the bacteria, not really the morphology and the arrangement of the bacteria cell. So that's somebody said later on. But anyway, he's the first person in the world about 400 years ago created a, a mechanic microscope and accurately observed microorganism and recorded it. But there is also some side scenes for him because he refused to sell in his microscopy to the other person make it commercialized. So it delayed the, dele the de development of microorganisms or microbiology area for a long time, maybe a hundred years. And you will see later on when we talk about Louis Pasteur, when we talk about Robert Koch, it's like al already a hundred years later or 150 years later. But what happened during that hundred years? Part of the reason some historic person says because he refused to sell in his microscope to the other person. Okay, so that's some, something about Antoni van Leeuwenhoek. Now next, we're gonna talk about is spontaneous generation, the conflicts over sp spontaneous generation. Um, this thing, even today, people still talking about spontaneous generation. 
part of the religion reason, part of the political reason. So what is spontaneous generation, which means you had a very simple, you had this empty flask or bottle. Suddenly, it's like nothing there. Oh, all of a sudden, come, comes out of something. Okay, maybe a rat, maybe some bacteria, maybe some, a, some, some animal suddenly showed up. You know, people were saying that. That's called spontaneous generation. Now, in the history, Francisco Reilly, an Italian scientist, is the first person to discredit spontaneous generation. And he did a very famous research, which is this meat, fly, and the maggots experiment. So what is the story about here? This is a raw meat. Um, you heard about this in the other classes, but we have to explain to you a little bit here. And, uh, so you can understand what's the story behind that. Okay, this is a meat, a raw meat. What is so-called spontaneous generation? Which means a raw meat is going to generate a fly. Okay? So, we have to do the experiment to make sure this fly is not coming from the raw meat, but at the same time, it's not coming from air. So, this is not coming from the meat. It is also not coming from the air. Because people will say it might come from the air. We have to verify there is not come from those two places. So what he did? First of all, this raw meat you expose to the air. So the fly is gonna go there. They are gonna have a lymph, they become a maggot. And then a new fly gonna comes out, the water fly gonna come comes out. So there's a fly around. Okay. The first thing. It comes out. The second thing. We want to make sure there is a the raw meat does not create a fly. So what we do? Then they cover with a solid paper. So a solid piece of paper is covered. So make sure there is no air there, and there's only meat there. And also the fly is not going to touch the meat, so nothing happens. This is verified. The raw meat will not generate the fly. But how about the air? How do we can verify the air is not generating the fly? This is a very smart. I tell you, what he did is so-called the cheese cross. Why this is a very smart way to do? Cheese cross, you see this air space there. However, the fly, the maggots will not touch it, will not go through. It should be a very thin one, not so thick one. Okay, very, very thin, the cheese cross. So make sure the air is going through, but the maggots, or we say the eggs of those fly, or we say it's a nymph, all those type of things, they <coughs> can't touch it. What he find, there is no fly. However, if the cover is removed, the cheese cross is removed, then the new fly will come out, comes out. What that means? Which means, first of all, the air is not generated fly, and the second thing, the fly is actually have a mother fly generated daughter fly. So those are the three things, what he did. From a raw meat and the maggots of the fly, then this created a spontaneous generation. Now, this is from an organism level, which means it could be a large animal or from the biology standpoint, but it's not from a microorganism standpoint. Now, who are the person really to discredit the spontaneous generation from a microorganism or microbiome standpoint is those two scientists, John Needman and uh, Lazaro Splat. Okay, both of them they did is you had a flask. This is the 
this is a flask, let's say. You have a molten bronze, and later on we will, we will learn. The bronze usually have a beef extract, has water, has salt. It is a very good medium for cultivation bacteria. So you have a bronze here. And the mutton broth, of course, it's like not really a sterilized. There are lots of the microorganisms. There. So you boil. Okay, you put the water there. Usually it's 100 degrees Celsius. You do the boring. And then you find it's going to be, become transparent, which means no microorganism grow there. But there is some people find it. Sometimes you're using a mutton broth. Okay, normally we should see no bacteria growing there. However, sometimes you didn't see bacteria grow. Okay, then what we should do? Because when you have this bottom broth, mutton broth, you boil it. Somebody see bacteria didn't grow, somebody see bacteria grow. Therefore, we cannot verify where the bacteria comes from. That could come from water, could come from air. That means it's not going to work very well from the to disrupt the spontaneous generation. So, what, ha what, what we can do? Louis Pasteur did a very smart stuff. It, it is swine neck plus. Okay, this is what this is what he did. This guy. This is called a swan neck. So what he did? This is a mutton boss. Okay, let's say mutton boss. You boil it. Of course there's a bacteria. You boil it. You do a boring. I was okay, then the bacteria died. And it will become like a transparent. And you will know, chorality, which means bacteria grow, transparent, which means no bacteria grow. Okay, so how he did that? He did two stuff. One thing, you come from here, okay? Another one you do not cut. When you cut it from here, the back, the this white mountain brass will show in turbidity. Because the bacteria from the air gonna go in through once you break the swan neck. In other hand, you have this guy, if you do not cut it, although the bacteria also on the air, however, this broth is very clear. Why? Because the bacteria hiding right here. Cannot go in through. So, from this standpoint, which indicates the bacteria is not generated from the broth. Because if you just uh, let it seal it, Okay, you boring it. Somebody find the bacteria didn't grow. Somebody see the bacteria grow. You can say the broth created a bacteria. And here, when you do this experiment, you can verify the broth did not create the bacteria. Where the bacteria come from? Come from the air. The air comes up. This is one neck which is holding bacteria on the side. However, lots of the scientists to repeat this experiment. Some of them get successful, some of them <coughs> did not get, get successful. Okay, by the way, you, some of you wants to do research. R-E-S-E-A-R-C-H. What means research? What means we? Somebody find it. You can find it again. That's called the research. So we need a multiple replication and verify the results. So lots of people did the same study find it's a different result. Somebody successful, somebody said it's still become turbidity. Why? 
You know that right now. Boring will not kill all the bacteria because some of the bacteria is heat resistant. What are the good example? Did you ever go Yellowstone? You go to the hot spring, did you see all the bacteria there? Some even have a label say this is a uh, bacteria coming from 200 years ago, or whatever. That is called the heat resistant bacteria. Now, why bacteria will become heat resistant? Of course, there's a genomic reason. But one of the reasons is some of the bacteria transforming in those spores. And we will talk about this in the lab. Some of the bacteria will form in those spores, and then they become heat resistant because in those spores is a very dominant structure. It's a protection structure because of their DNA is a little bit different from the others. And we'll talk about detail later. Therefore, some of the scientists repeated the experiments, do the further study, and they find these two conclusions, which is John Tidal and Ferdinand Kahn. And John Tidal find why the bacteria can grow even in boring it. Because they have some of them heat resistant. And uh, Ferdinand Cohn find, find the reason is because some of the bacteria have endospore. And I tell you, Clostridium and the Bacillus, those two major bacteria will generate endospore. Okay, so, so, so the story is very simple. The whole story is that you using the swan neck, you can bury it. The bacteria coming from the air is not coming from the broth or something in general. But why you using a boring? Some of the bacteria still survive there because they are heat resistant. And part of the reason they have windows. Okay, so that's the story. And the finally, after John Tidal and the Ferdinand Cohn, they did this research from microorganism standpoint in a microbiology level. We finally discredit spontaneous generation. So here is something we talk about. Now, by the way, I want to talk to Louis Pasteur a little bit. He is a French scientist. Do you see pasteurization, where that comes from? That comes from him. But not only for that, he did a lot of contribution for the microbiology standpoint. So a lot of the institutions in the world they named by Louis Pasteur. You see Pasteur microorganism institution everywhere, in China, in France, in France, in Europe, uh, in the in Southeast Asian countries, all the, all, the, all the places. People want to memorize his contribution, okay? This guy, uh, Robert Koch, is a great German scientist. He Explain. I did a lot of stuff. I tell you, what we have here is just uh, his most uh, two contribu contributions. We mentioned here. We talk about arthritis and the bacillus, the relationship between that. But beyond that, the more important he is talking about is Coke postulates, which is explain the relationship between microorganism and a particular disease. So we're going to talk about here. This is talk about Coke postulates. So what that means, that's a relationship between a bacteria and a specific disease. So this is talking about the bacteria as a relationship with a disease. Okay, what are the key as the four key issue of these postulates. Number one, we can say healthy uh, animal without a microorganism. I'll just say microorganism. And the uh, Diseased or sick animal, we just say sick animal. Presented my problem. This is the first thing. 
Okay, second. This microorganism can be isolated from sick animals. Number three, this isolated microorganism infected a new subject get same disease or similar disease. Number four, this microorganism could be re-isolated from the sick subject. This is the key of these four. So you can see, you can read us through these. I just use my language to let you understand. Let's say we have one patient has contaminated with microbacterial tuberculosis. This is TB. You heard about that all the time. Before antibiotics has been created back in 1940s, microbacterial tuberculosis is like a cancer. You got it, you died. No way to do. In back in China, a hundred years ago, lots of traditional methods they tried to work. You know heard about the Chinese traditional methods is very magic lots of the time. Um, those acupuncture, those things, very uh, some herbs, very magical. However, it's not going to work for microbacterial tuberculosis unless antibiotics comes out. So at that time, people get it, then they die. Uh, we will talk about this in the lab. We won't do it, but I will mention detail when we do the endospores thing. Okay, if the person has microbacterial tuberculosis, it will have a disease. Then. Microtuberculosis will have an isolated from the blood cereal has an osputal sample. Get the pure culture. Uh, we will mention pure culture real quick. Then, if the pure culture you re infected with a fresh, healthy animal, let's say here is a genie pig, this genie pig will gonna get tuberculosis. Then the tuberculosis can re isolate from this genie pig. Okay, so that's a coke postulate which is described very basically a bacteria with a disease. However, you need to know, this is about 200 years ago. What they're missing here, you heard that sentence, you had that terminology all the time these days. It's called asymptom, is that right? Which is related to immunology. This one not cover asymptom. When the COVID-19 comes, you heard about it all the time. We have so many cases, 40% so is asymptom. Is that right? This one does not be covered. People carrying microorganism, carrying the pathogen, has not shown any symptoms. This area does not cover. It's the reason is immune.